Hey, welcome to Daddy's Workshop of the Carolinas, where we treasure things made and restored by hand. Today I've got my good friend Jeff with me, and he's going to give us a little tour of these Delta Triple Duty Grinders. These are classic machines, and he's turned into a bit of a guru on these the last few years and has worked on a lot of them. So let's see what he has to tell us today. Okay, well, thanks for having me on, Josh, and I do want to give a nice good call out to Josh. It was Josh's original Delta Triple Duty Grinder restoration on this 1957 unit and the companion uh, BG40 CG9 pedestal with these great Art Deco lines that was the inspiration for me to get started in all of this. So within the last couple of years I have worked on quite a number of grinders from 42 uh, up through 47 and I told Josh I had a vision that we'd do some more videos and get together several grinders. So what we have today is Josh's original resto job 1957. Uh, we've got a 1947 unit that I've done a complete uh, restoration on within the last year. And then we have a newly sourced unit here, which is a 1942 unit, which is fairly complete. And I thought it'd be good to run through all the salient differences between these various years. And perhaps the first thing to go through, which goes back to the basics of the 1935 patent that was filed by an individual whose last name was T-A-U-T-Z, not sure how to pronounce the man's name, but he put in a patent application for safety shields, which is essentially just the, the top part of the grinder. And uh, the patent went in in October of 35 and was granted by February of 37 and was assigned to the Delta Company. So I thought that would be a good place to start as far as going through differences. Uh, when we show you the detailed pictures, you'll see that the 1942 and the 1947 twin lights, the, the basic uh, casting piece, you'll find that the patent number was listed on the bottom side of the unit. Whereas by the 1950s, I think Delta decided to make it more of a marketing showplace. So they put the name Twin Light and the patent number, the US patent number and the design patent number are listed up on the top. Just a little bit of more showmanship, if you will, on the part of Delta by, this, by the 50s. But I think you look at the nice clean lines, the beautiful clean lines of the ones in the 40s, I think they turned out quite a bit nicer. A couple other things that are differences. Uh, if you'll notice where the bow springs hook in the front, in the 1942 era and up through the 44 unit that I had too, there are square holes where the little bow spring holds in the shatterproof glass. That had been simplified just a little bit down to a round by 1947. A little cheaper, a little easier for Delta to manufacture, no doubt, on what was a fairly complicated casting to begin with. And again, that carried up through, certainly up through the 50s. If you see the design of the safety shields up in the 60s, I think they're very boxy and not at all very aesthetic looking. So some interesting changes on all of that. If we go back and look at the basic, the nameplate, the, the face plate, uh, very interesting to see the shadow style of font that was used and the really very beautiful, just almost a work of art sort of nameplate that was common, that was standard in 42. They had made some minor changes which carried over into 47 where the lettering, instead of being of the shadow style, is a little simpler. And obviously, by the time we get up into the 50s, it was a far more utilitarian, just business-like, industrial style of, of faceplate. Uh, the small plate uh, that is for the switch, if you were to look at the actual name of it, it is called the switch indicator plate. In the 42 era, and also similar to the 44 era unit that I've restored, it, it's a very simple, nice-looking plate. By 1947, the, the Delta had made a decision to put the uh, regulation U.S. Patent Office sort of insignia on that, on that label. Um, you'll also notice that the actual type of switch in the 47, this is an original 47 switch, which is a simple toggle switch. And you go back and look at the 42, this is more uh, reminiscent of the sort of ball switch that you might find on Unisaw. Again, this is a very beautiful, nice work of art here, and a nice sort of carryover to use that ball switch. Looks a little nicer, but certainly by 47 had moved up to a more utilitarian toggle switch. Uh, as far as going through other things on the grinders that have changed over time, uh, if you look at just the basic tool rest mechanism, it was a three-piece part. Uh, I think if you were to look at the official names of all of the pieces, the top one is actually the tool rest, and then you've got an extension piece, and then you have the actual arm piece. And that extension piece and the arm piece, by the time you moved up into the 50s, have been much simplified into a single piece. Still fit in the same basic casting that, that covers the wheel, but was again a little cheaper and a little easier. 
Uh, these having had having those three pieces on them are far easier to adjust. Just a couple turns of these, and, and you can adjust them. We haven't tightened it very bit, but so you can move them every which way to Sunday, which is very nice from a flexibility standpoint. But at the same time, sometimes a little hard to get these tied down. So in my work on restoring these, I found it interesting that oftentimes the washers are in very bad condition because of that having been tightened down so much. This exact 47 that we have here, and we'll list in the details, and I think in some of the static pictures, we'll have the actual serial number still. Um, these are in absolutely the best condition I've ever seen of all of the half a dozen or so units that I've had in my possession in the last two years. Uh, these are almost original. I can see very, very little wear on this 40, 47 machine. Uh, given this is, is typical, highly restorable condition as we're seeing here, we haven't even begun to, to put on some PV blaster and begin to soften these things up and, and loosen them up and get them out and clean them up. But when this is done, I think we'll have some pretty pictures of this that we ought to be able to show people at some time, too. Let's see, is there any other thing, Josh, that you think we can show people from the front side? Am I missing anything? Uh, what about the acorn nuts? Ah, yes, acorn nuts. These, there's the acorn nuts that are at the top. We'll get some detailed photos of these, too. I think it's very interesting to show how these can shine up and look really great with not that much work. Um, at the same time, uh, the acorn nuts that hold, hold the end bells into the basic portion of the motor that contains the stator and rotor components, uh, these start off looking quite ugly, but they do clean up. The ones I've got here are ab absolute originals to this unit, and they shine up very nice with just 400, 600 grit sandpaper. Uh, oftentimes, uh, if restorers come along and want to bring one of these back up to speed, it's very difficult to find these, these acorn nuts and get them the nice brassy ones. You can always find stainless or other uh, coated steel. Uh, Josh, I'm trying to think. Anything else we thought everybody would want to see from, from the main front view here? I think that's it. Let me move the camera and we'll do some from the other side. Here we are in for some more detailed close-up backup shots of these three beautiful triple duty grinders. Uh, very interesting, I thought, to go through the cabling on the back side. Uh, this 1942 unit is using the original cabling, which was referred to as armored cable in the patent and was referred to as armored lamp cord in the parts list from that era. And it's very stout, very good. This one has a bit of paint on it, but I think it'll restore up or, or refurbish up quite nicely. Uh, the 1947 unit I did take and uh, cobbled together some braided cord that came from a 1944 unit. Imagine how the War Production Board in the middle of World War II in going through every industry and trying to save strategic materials made a choice to get rid of the metal and go down to a braided cable that was fairly popular in other applications at that time, but Delta was probably forced to use that because of the War Production Board would be my guess. Uh, it may be from a restoration purist standpoint quite a nightmare, but imagine what we're forced to do as restorers refurbishing people when you don't have original cables at your disposal. You're forced to use more common, uh, recently manufactured sort of units, which of course work fine. Uh, in any resto that I've done, I've always added in a grounding wire and tapped into the base and made sure I've had good electrical contact to have a safety three-pronged switch on all of these. Uh, I think that's necessary, and again, from a restoration purist standpoint, that might be a nightmare but I do think that's a very valid and relevant thing to do. Uh, looking along here, uh, we've also got access to a couple of well sought after sort of accessories. Uh, this is a nice uh, water pot and the extender bar. Uh, oftentimes, these will be in rather poor condition or non-existent. Now imagine the inside of this as a nice big casting was just raw metal and you added water to this. It was very, very prone to rusting. So this one that we've got here, we recently sourced, is in probably the best condition of a unit that I've seen. There is some pitting on the inside, but I believe this will clean up just nicely from a restoration standpoint. Uh, we've also got over here a, the uh, edge tool grinding attachment. And we have some of the original literature behind this. Uh, Josh has put one on his 1957 unit. And he's been gracious enough to hand this to me and say, Jeff, you do your magic on this, resto this, clean it up, and get it on a unit. And we'll see what we can do in the future to get this one up to speed. Too. So what changed with the serial number tags, Jeff? Uh, along the way, imagine back in 1942, 
uh, this serial number tag up through 47, and I don't know how much later after 47, but certainly at this end it was generally a metal tag. Uh, if you go up to Vintage Machinery and look up the, the Delta serial number tag, you'll see pictures of various styles there. Uh, the one that I found is a, is a very highly sought after is that oil impregnated uh, cardboard one from 42, 43. Uh, that was another issue with the War Production Board wanting to save precious metals. Uh, my experience with those is given they are made out of paper, they're very prone to degrading and not even being there. Uh, the only ones that I've managed to own that have the paper tag on it were actually covered over with paint. Uh, I've also had these metal style tags covered over with paint and it's a bit of a curse when you've got it on metal because you have to be very careful not to remove any of, of the red paint that was prevalent at that time. Uh, but from an from a oil impregnated, that oil based cardboard, it's a blessing because then you just chip off the paint and voila, there's a good solid, very rare and very hard to find tag. Uh, by the 50s, we had moved up to a tag that was just on the back of the motor. Uh, maybe one more detail I forgot to show earlier. Uh, again, this would be viewed perhaps as a restoration person's nightmare. Uh, the bayonet base bulbs that go in these, I find it's very nice to use just modern LEDs. You get good strong light and of course quite reliable and will last for a long time. It, hard enough to find, but a few times I have had machines that the old bulbs are still operational. Wanted to give you another chance to view some details from the front side. We put the water pot and the extender bar on Josh's machine and they look quite pretty. All the more reason this is a beautiful sort of project to do, to take these old Art Deco style machines, paint it out and make it look beautiful. Uh, another item we wanted to point out, uh, on the actual shatterproof glass that was prevalent back in the 40s, the 42, this 42 unit and the 44 unit that I've owned both have a sandwich style construction, dual level shatterproof glass that has held up quite well for almost 80 years of wear. The two 1947 units that I've owned both have a very interesting sort of delamination. It's also a, a two level sandwich, uh, but both of them have very similar delamination issues. So I don't quite know, I often wonder what Delta might have done in the manufacturing process or what their glass vendor did and delivering shatterproof glass that by 47 it started to delaminate. Uh, but also imagine, what Josh has done now is just modern polycarbonate, very easy to cut and place in, uh, and you can do it, use it either with bow springs or without. Bow springs are one of those sort of $11 items that if you want to spend a little more on a resto, uh, there is somebody who's out there doing aftermarket parts so they can be found. And original ones generally will, will clean up quite well. A bit, of a bit of axle grease and getting in there with sandpaper. Uh, one other thought back to the safety shields. Uh, the original units were generally covered with paint, which uh, oftentimes, here you are 80 years later, is not in very good condition. Uh, Josh has done a pretty good job of, on his unit of just pulling off all the paint and, and getting it down to a smoother surface. Uh, it takes a lot of time, but I have uh, gone another route with these, which is to go from 220 grit up through 320 grit up through 400 grit all the way to a 600 grit sandpaper uh, and create quite a nice looking surface. Uh, what you're seeing here has probably been done, I don't know, four or five months ago and it doesn't take very long and it loses its sheen. So if you really want it to look resto quality, either you're going to have to come up with some way to put a, a final coat of clear coat on it or to find some waxing mechanism. But I've, I've decided not to go to that extent on this. Just sand it up to about 600 grit and they come out looking really nice. Okay, one final thing to note here would be the paint scheme and the decals. Uh, what Josh has done here on the 1957 is a charcoal gray uh, complemented with a flat black. And again, the pinstriping on this BG40 CG9 and then reverse pinstriping, I think it's just gorgeous. I've done a very similar job when I've done pedestals. Uh, but you'll notice on my 47, the two colors that I've used is dark machine gray coupled with a carbon mist. Uh, if we go back and look at this 42, both Josh and I feel pretty confident that this is the original paint uh, on this, so hard to describe the color and the look of it. Uh, I do believe the twin lights were painted differently, at least that's my impression based upon this. But you'll also see a very much sought after decal here. These things are generally very fragile. And when it gets down to painting and doing resto work on this machine, I really don't think I'm going to do much to this at all. 
because of the fragility of this sort of a decal. Thought we would give you all a chance to listen. Audio sometimes over the internet doesn't come across as all that compelling, but still need to run you this unit, which we believe still has the original bearings, versus the other two which have had the bearings replaced. Here's the 42. Certainly, I think some level of hum there. If I'm going to do a full-blown resto on this, we're obviously going to replace the bearings. All things considered, it's not too bad, though. That, that's... Oh, no. No, that doesn't sound too bad. The level of carbon buildup over here, Josh, tells me if this thing has had some goodness. Okay, and here we go with the 47. Nice and smooth sounding with these new bearings. There's probably less than one hour's worth of just burn-in testing time on these bearings. No real use. And of course, there's no wheels on that one, so you were hearing the, the rattle of the, the washers and the nuts there. Yep, absolutely. So, Jeff, you've torn apart a bunch of these now. What are some of the common problems or tips you'd give to people that are working through one of these grinders? Okay, beautiful question there, Josh. Uh, first off, I'd say go back and review Josh's two-part series when he took, thoroughly took this apart as your baseline, which, again, was my inspiration when I got started on these. Uh, given my experiences have been in working with 40, up until now have been working with a primarily 44 and 47 units, uh, removal of the end bells and actually getting at the bearings, I've had a much easier time than what I think Josh experienced in working in this 1950s unit. The, the interface between the main part of the motor and the end bells was, I, I believe it was at a higher level of tolerance back in the 40s, that there was a bit more machining done. Uh, I found it easy enough to just tap, 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 the centrifugal switch is on, if you will, the right side, this side, uh, when you look at the unit. And you can't push the shaft over more this direction, but the shaft can be ding, ding, ding. You obviously, of course, don't want to hit it straight with a hammer, but if you put a little block of wood and then tap, 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 I have generally been able to push the access, the axes of the main shaft to the left, and slowly the bearing will start to come off on one end or the other. Then you have a little bit of play to go back and forth, and I've never had, never in all the ones I've pulled apart, which is less than 10, but more than three at this point, um, I've never had an issue with getting bearings off and being forced to use a bearing puller. I have simply done some wedging with uh, a, initially, say, maybe a quarter inch sheet of plywood and then be able to tap some more on the bearing, get the bearing off on one end. It's been easy enough in my estimation then to, to give a shot on a, on a perpendicular to the end bell and get the end bell to pop off. And then the last end bell is usually quite a cinch by the time you get to there. Uh, bearings are a standard, I think the number is an 88503. Uh, we'll, we'll go back and double check that on the parts list. Uh, it is a classic bearing size available all over the place. I've generally ordered from a bearing supply house. had no problem getting good, good quality bearings to place in these at a reasonable price. How about a way to see, to gauge how much use these have had if you're looking at one? What are some ways that you could get a rough idea of how much use it's seen? Well, uh, carbon buildup, good, good question, Josh. Uh, this unit exhibits what I consider sort of a traditional carbon buildup on one of the two sides. Uh, if, if a lot of metal was hogged off of things, uh, oftentimes it would carbonize and, and get into this kind of brittle. Uh, I've spent upwards of an hour, uh, for example, on taking this end piece and removing all of the buildup gunk there. Uh, so if you don't have much buildup of gunk, good idea that there wasn't much wear on it. This 47 came across to me with, I'm guessing, maybe no more than about one year's worth of, of use uh, across its whole life. Uh, the chap I bought it from, I don't think I used it much. And I don't get the impression, particularly uh, the wear points up, up on the tool rest are another good proxy for how much wear the unit has actually seen. Uh, you'll notice on this one too that uh, while it is a bit rusty, uh, that is all just surface rust. And I do believe the PB Blaster is going to allow these to come off pretty easily. At, at the same time, there's always the risk that if you bang, bang, bang too hard on something, next thing you know you're going to break things. So uh, PB Blaster, a couple of days wait, tap, tap. PB Blaster some more, a couple of days wait, I think is always a bit of patience and a lot of PB Blaster I think is a helpful route to go. A uh, couple of heads up things to think about if one's delving into a full, full off restoration on one of these where you tear it, tear it down to the rotor and stator separately. 
Uh, three things I, I consider important to pay attention to. First one, perhaps, is the bearing retainer net that was common on the side of the centrifugal switch. Uh, that helps gauge that the centrifugal switch is just the right distance, if you will, from where the bearing is located to, to guarantee that the centrifugal switch will work properly. Uh, pulling things apart here, I've never had a problem with that retainer nut in getting it off. It's an, it's an annular sort of nut. Um, but at the same time, if one is not careful, I have actually had a centrifugal switch jump the tracks, so to speak, inside the motor. When, when you're pulling the shaft out, the last thing you want to do, the centrifugal switch is, is a sensitive little instrument. And it took a bit of time then to get one that had jumped the tracks to go back in place. Uh, the retainer nut, the centrifugal switch. Uh, also an interesting uh, difference between a unit from the 50s. Uh, when you see Josh's uh, detailed videos on this exact unit, uh, he did replace this, the capacitor start in there. Uh, these units, that's another change over time in, in the delta evolution of a triple duty grinder. That These 40s units, they simply put more copper wire into it and were able to do a good startup sequence without having to resort to a capacitor. So one less thing to have to pay attention to when you do the, the, the electrical side of this. But very careful to make sure that you don't mess with the centrifugal switch, if you will, but otherwise fairly simple wiring. Uh, easy enough also to note that in my experience, pulling apart these motors, there is such a good and tight seal here, I have never really seen any rust or degradation on the inside of any of these motors. My experience has been that these all come out unbelievably clean on the inside. That the, Almost the wetness of the covering on all of the windings just looks superb, and the shaft itself has always been in excellent condition. Well, there you have it, a good source of info, tips, and tricks for your grinder restoration. Big thanks to Jeff for coming today. And also, I wanted to give a shout out to Mike, a good friend of ours, who's been a great resource of information and so much more on all this. He is a vintage machinery legend. Any final thoughts, Jeff? Well, thank you, Josh. Glad to have a chance to come here and talk about this. And I want to echo what Josh has said. That if I can do this, I think you can do this too. It was Josh's inspiration that got me started in only a couple of years of taking baby steps to pull apart these beauties and bring them back to life.